Howdy. Today we're going to continue our uh, search and foray into things that are not quite crystals. Uh, so we can call these almost crystals or sort of crystals. Um, and we're going to cover an, a range of things um, that have some kind of bizarre properties um, and in some ways uh, break some of the rules that we learn for traditional crystals. And so quasi crystals is a great example of that. Um, this video is going to focus on plastic crystals and what are called fast ion diffusers. Uh, and the separate next video uh, is going to focus on quasi-crystals. So we've already discussed degrees of freedom, um, and we can kind of consider what happens to a system that starts off as a liquid. Um, and a liquid, uh, things have positional or translational degrees of freedom and, and directional degrees of freedom. Um, and then what happens if we start to condense those systems and cool them down? Um, and so amorphous materials, uh, or structural glasses are what happens when these things are tend to be cooled relatively quickly um, and they're sort of trapped in a, um, a relatively disordered state. Uh, and in these cases, again, we have no directional or translational long range order. So if I know something about uh, the position uh, of one of the building blocks, one of these molecules over here, um, I can't really tell you anything about either the position or the orientation of a molecule even a couple of units away. Um, and so that's very different from what we think of as ordered crystals. And so again, you know, ordered crystals we learned before things, you know, generally they occur when the system's allowed to cool slowly. Um, and they have both directional and translational uh, long range order. So if I know the position uh, of one unit over here, uh, I could tell you where I'm likely to find another one some distance away. And I could also tell you um, the orientation, the direction that that's pointing in. So these are two extremes, and we've already seen something kind of halfway between that spectrum. Uh, and that was previously when we talked about liquid crystals. Mm, so again, remember liquid crystals are things that have directional long range order. So this molecule is pointing in one per particular direction, uh, and its friend down here is pointing in the same way. Um, uh, and depending on what kind of liquid crystal we're talking about, they might have no translational long range order. So that would be true for pneumatic liquid crystals, or they might have some translational long range order. Um, for, so for smectic liquid crystals, these molecules uh, tend to be arranged in layers. Um, and so they have some long range order along this axis, let's call this the Z axis, um, but they're relatively disordered uh, within the plane, so in the X and Y axis. So they have some translational long range order. Um, so you can kind of think to yourself, okay, based on what we've seen so far, what is missing from this diagram? Um, and chances are, if there's some, uh, some opposite case that's missing, we could go out there and if we look hard enough, we could find it. Um, and that's exactly the case. So the things that we're gonna start off talking about today are plastic or glassy crystals. Um, and they're sort of the opposite of liquid crystals in some sense. Uh, because they have translational long range order, so the molecules are sitting on a lattice. So if I know the position of a molecule here, I can tell you uh, that there's also gonna be a molecule way over here, um, but they do not have directional long range order. And so that means each molecule is relatively free to spin or, or rotate, or, or at least be oriented in different positions. Um, and so the difference between these two things is that plastic crystals are actually free to keep rotating and spinning, kind of like a liquid. So each of these molecules, if you take one snapshot in time and another snapshot in time, they might be oriented in different directions. And that's different from a glassy crystal, which kind of like a structural glass means that they've been frozen in place. And so while the molecules are not pointing in the same direction anymore, um, they, uh, they're not rotating with the same frequency that these plastic crystal molecules are likely to. So this is an example of something that does have translational long range order, but does not have directional long range order. And you can actually start to think about all kinds of different combinations. And, and we sort of get at that case a little bit here in terms of smectic liquid crystals, because these are things that, you know, maybe they have translational order in one sense, um, but not in another direction. 
Um, so you could kind of start to work your way through a table and say, well, what would it mean if I would have maybe directional long range order in some, in some axis, but not in others? Um, so there's all kinds of weird intermediate states. Um, and uh, we're, we're gonna kind of explore a couple of these other intermediate cases today um, and give examples of why they're technologically useful. Um, and again, we're gonna start off by talking about plastic crystals. So the first question is why do they occur, right? It's, it's kind of a weird phenomenon to have a case where the molecules are stuck in a particular place in a position, but they're free to spin, or at least they're pointing in different directions, like a glassy crystal. Um, so why does that happen? And, and again, by example, we can think about why is it that liquid crystals tend to align in some direction? And we talked about this before. Liquid crystals tend to have orientational order, not because of any kind of strong bonding in between these molecules. In fact, the bonding tends to be relatively weak. Um, but instead, the liquid crystals have orientational order because of the, the very anisotropic shape. So uh, it, uh, it is elongate along one particular direction. So this would be a rod-like mesogen. Or we have, again, we have disc-like mesogens. Um, but because they have this aspherical shape, they're, they're pointing in some particular direction, then when they, they coalesce, when we pack a bunch of these things together, they tend to be pointing in the same direction. So liquid crystals have orientational order essentially due to their shape uh, and the fact that it's not a sphere. Um, and so if we want to think about a case, um, if we'd like to design the ideal pl plastic crystal, the thing where that molecule would be able to, to spin freely in, in, in different directions, then what should those basic building blocks be? Well, they should be the sphere, right? So they should be a shape that uh, is not going to restrict it at all in terms of uh, what direction it's pointing. I'm sorry that it looks like I'm a kindergartner here. I'm writing with my mouse, um, so <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, but the point is that if we want to design a plastic crystal, the building blocks ideally should be spherical, and, and that is the case. So these are some examples of um, molecules that tend to um, be plastic uh, crystals. And, you know, it's a little hard to see just from this 2D representation, but a lot of them have a roughly spherical symmetry, um, particularly things like this, which are basically icosahedrons um, with some uh, functional groups off the side. Um, so I mentioned before that the difference between plastic crystals and glassy crystals is that plastic crystals are dynamic. They tend to move. Um, and this is probably a hard thing to measure because really you're trying to, you know, um, measure the orientation of many, many different molecules. And so um, how do we do that? One technique is by using uh, dielectric spectroscopy, so an, an alternating electric field, and we're, we're basically measuring the, um, the resistance to changing that field. Um, and so what this data shed is showing, this is for an example um, of a material that undergoes a transition from a plastic crystal to a glassy crystal state. At different temperatures, uh, there's a local peak uh, in uh, this particular part of the dielectric constant. And so we're not gonna get into all of that, um, but, but all that's important to know is that, you know, this temperature here corresponds, or, or I'm sorry, this, this frequency here, because what we're plotting on the horizontal axis um, is a frequency in terms of hertz or cycles per second. Um, and the f this frequency is the frequency um, at which the molecule uh, can actually r relax. So if I try and oscillate it faster than that frequency, um, the molecule can't keep up. Um, and so what happens is as we cool the system down, we go to lower and lower temperatures, that relaxation frequency uh, starts to decrease. And so, you know, another way to interpret this is that lower temperatures, the molecule is not able to um, rotate around as quickly as it is at higher temperatures. Um, so essentially what we can do is we can, we can plot um, these relaxation temperatures uh, versus the, uh, the, the frequency uh, of relaxation, and, and we, can, we can understand a relationship that way. So that was an example, again, of, of, of uh, elements or, or of a form of matter that is sort of occupying another um, point on the spectrum between liquids uh, and crystals. Um, so another really interesting thing we could ask is, is it possible 
to have materials that behave attribute or um, uh, exhibit attributes of both liquids and crystals simultaneously. Um, and I wouldn't be talking about it if this wasn't a thing. Um, and we call these things fast ion diffusers. Um, and a perfect example is, is silver iodide. Um, so silver iodide uh, has um, a, you know, a particular structure where uh, at low temperatures, these purple uh, globs are the uh, iodine anions uh, and the blue blots are silver cations. Uh, but as I increase temperature, so as I heat the system up, what happens is that that silver cation lattice tends to melt while the iodine anions remain a rigid uh, lattice. Um, so the, the reason that we kind of call them partially between um, solids and liquids is that the anion lattice is still a solid crystalline lattice, a well-defined lattice, but these cations are able to move around um, with, with a high enough velocity and uh, with a high enough frequency um, that, that we can't really pretend the cations are sitting in one particular position in time anymore. And so it's essentially like the cations, the silver sublattice has melted. Um, and so we call these things fast ion diffusers um, because when that silver sublattice has melted, those silver cations are allowed to move very freely in and out of that iodine anion lattice. Um, and, you know, one way to look at this is to look at that basic um, lattice of uh, iodine anions. And again, they form a, a BCC lattice here. Um, and then the, the silver cations are, they're going to occupy some particular state. And what this plot is showing is what are the available octahedral or tetragonal or trigonal states. Um, but there are a lot of different potential positions and states to occupy. Um, and in fast ion diffusers, the energy to jump from one site, let's say I'm on this octahedral interstitial site, to another site is low enough um, that these, again, these silver cations are always shuffling and moving around. Um, and we can look at this in terms of activation energy landscapes. Um, this is uh, kind of the way that we, we, we like to think about things if we're you know, asking what does one atom see? What, what energy does one atom see when it moves from you know, one site to another site? And generally, you know, there, there's a low energy position that the atom or the cation in this case likes to occupy. Uh, and it has to go over some localized uh, energy maximums. So there's some uh, energy barrier that is stopping it from moving around. But once it goes over that barrier, it's free to sort of slide into um, another low energy position over here. Uh, and so what happens again in uh, fast ion diffusers is that barrier height has um, decrease low enough uh, that, you know, these cations are shuffling around with a very high frequency. Um, and so av on average, they're still sitting on a, you know, uh, one of these uh, potential interstitial sites, um, but they're able to move around enough that we can essentially treat them as liquids. Um, so that's a great, you know, uh, maybe a curiosity, um, but it turns out that these are technologically incredibly important. So if you think about a system where you'd like to be able to move ions in and out very quickly, probably the first thing that comes to mind are batteries. Um, and lithium batteries, you know, are, are basically based on this concept where we have a crystalline lattice and lithium uh, cations are able to intercalate, sort of slide into the holes in that lattice um, very freely. Um, and the, the faster those lithium atoms uh, can slide into those positions, the faster you can charge or discharge your battery. Um, and so essentially, one can consider a lot of the search for the new battery um, cathode materials that's going on um, to be people that are, you know, systematically looking at the landscape saying, okay, what kind of crystal structures um, can we create that have fast pathways for lithium cations, you know, to get in and out of the crystal lattice. Uh, and so this is an example uh, where there, there sort of are channels along the crystallographic lattice that those lithium ions um, can rapidly go in and out of. Um, in this case, we have more of a 3D uh, interpenetrating network. Um, but again, a lot of the different battery cathode materials that are under investigation, 
are of interest because uh, they have these fast ion channels, these, um, these highways that uh, cations are able to move in and out of. So it turns out that, you know, by studying structure of materials, you're not just sort of learning uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, peculiar things. You're, you're learning things about how to make um, and how to create materials uh, that can really be technologically impactful. Um, so we're going to stop here uh, and we're going to pick up in the next lecture uh, talking about quasi-crystals.